We're so glad you're here today, and uh, do you enjoy last night? Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, are you ready to have another round at it this morning? All right. Without further ado, I would like to introduce you to the one and only Tom Loud from Seattle, Washington. <laughs> Bless you, brother. Bless you. Thank you. So I've already heard this morning a few really awesome testimonies, but, and I really could pull out a few people. I'm just going to pull out Wes. Wes, come on up here. It's because Wes is, goes to this church, right? All right. Come on, Wes. So Wes, tell us, he came up for prayer last night. He had a couple things wrong. He had uh, slipped off a ladder four years ago, was it? You like broke both ankles. Okay. He really messed up his ankles, and he's had pain ever since, right? Yeah, every day when he wakes up. Plus, he had emphysema, so he's having breathing problems. So, Wes, tell us how you are today. I'm doing great. <laughs> well, uh, there's no pain in my ankles. And uh, last night I got home, and I thought I'd test out my lungs. So I walked up and down my basement stairs a couple times. I wasn't breathing hard or anything. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, usually I'm a panting and huffing and aching and shaking and all that. But uh, I just breathe as normal as anybody else. <laughs> Amen, Wes. Bless you. So Wes has no pain. And you know what? When I, when I saw Wes, uh, a couple people <laughs> noticed Wes. When, when he had, I think he was the first person I prayed for last night. So I prayed for him, and I said, okay, check your ankles out. And a couple people noticed the look on his face. It's like, well, that's, he did this weird look, this weird look. You know, it's like. <laughs> he had no pain. Now, I never get tired of seeing that. You won't either. It's awesome to see, see people set free. It is awesome. So uh, here's what we're going to do today. You see. I always know, I, I do usually, I do a Friday night, Saturday, and a Sunday, and I know how it works. And the, the lowest crowd is on the Saturday because a lot of people chicken out. It's okay. You're here, okay? And you, just one little flame, can set a whole church on fire. You bring revival wherever you're at. You carry it in you. See, it's God that worketh in you, both to will and to do His good pleasure. I had a man ask me, a man right here today, he said, I wonder why I feel this motivation to, to even do this, you know, step out of your comfort zone to go out and pray for people. To I said, that's because it's God that works in you to will and to do his good pleasure, and God wants to do this through you, and you're just responding to that desire, and you will find as you do it, there's great fulfillment in doing it. There's great fulfillment in seeing people set free, great fulfillment in seeing people get saved. Great fulfillment in seeing people. Uh, you know, I've taken people out. I remember one time I took one of our elders in our church out, uh, a man from Africa, or, and uh, took him out. I said, come out with me one day. We're gonna, I'm going to take you to the mall. I'll show you what we do, you know. Took him out and, and prayed for a couple people. This one woman came out of a wheelchair, you know. She had been hit by a car. She, she was walking. She goes, well, I won't tell you what she said because she swore, but she was, like, excited. And uh, he's like, I feel like I just got born again. He'd been saved a long time, but this just revitalized him. You start walking in the things of the God, the power of God, it'll revitalize you. It's a revival right there. So you can have a revival today. All right? Um, I'm going to do two things. I'll give you just a little bit more teaching on how to get your head straightened out. But then we're going to show you all the hands-on that you need so that you know how to do, how to do what you need to do how to pray for people, how to approach people, the mindset. We're going to give you all the tools you need to do what you need to do today, okay? Now, how many people have some fear and trepidation in themselves right now about this? Good. So, I'll tell you, um, I always tell people this story. Is, uh, I have a good friend of mine. His name's Aaron Baker, and uh, he's in some of my videos. He's He's a black gentleman, and he's really big because he was Mr. USA. He's 
professional bodybuilder. And I, I trained him, so he goes out with me now. He trains others. I trained him not in weights, but, you know, praying for people. And uh, he was in the Army, and he was a paratrooper. He jumped out of airplanes. So let me tell you how this works. Is if you enlist in the Army, you say, I, I want to sign up. I want to sign up for military, and you're in the Army. And uh, they lie to you a lot, okay? It's just the way it is. Government lies to you a lot. So, so they'll say to you, uh, what would you like to do in the Army? Well, I'd like to be, uh, you know, a medic's helper. I'd like to be an electronics technician or whatever. Fine! And once they get you in, they'll do whatever they feel like. Whatever they feel like. You're going to do this. But I don't want it. That's too bad. You're doing it. You, we, you belong to us. And you're either going to do it or go to Leavenworth. Take your pick. Right? So they say to you, you're going to jump out of airplanes. And you say, oh, wait, hold on a second. You got the wrong guy because I'm afraid of heights. I can't even stand on a ladder. So I can't jump out of an airplane. So you've got the wrong guy. They said, well, that, that's really not our problem. You're jumping out of airplanes. No, you don't understand. That'll freak me out. It, that's okay. We're fine with that. You can be freaked out. You're still going out of an airplane. You go, no, I can't. I can't. I can't. Well, you're going to show up for class or be in jail. Take your pick. So you show up for class, and they're training you all the theory, 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 you know, tell you about gravity. You'll fall. After you get out of the plane, you'll fall, you know? And, and, and if you, if you parachute doesn't open, the fall will not kill you. It's the sudden stop that kills you, all right? So, so they touch you. They'll tell you exactly what to do. And then they say, now we're going to do some little, uh, little training, uh, you know, before you go up. And they got like a zip line, and they'll have you zip down and kind of hit the ground and roll so you know how to fall. Then they'll say, now suit up, you're going to go up in an airplane. You go, no, I, this is where i got to draw the line. I can't do this. They go, you're going up. No, I can't. They go, you're going up. So they get you in a suit, and you're all suited up, and you got a parachute on. You go, I can't do this. They go, that's okay. You go up, you will go out. I guarantee it. So you go, no, I can't. I can't jump. I will not jump. Oh, you, you, will, you don't need to jump. You'll go out. So you get up there, and they got you on this thing called a static line, and they open the door, and they go, jump, first guy, second, jump, jump, jump. They get to you, and you go, I'm not going. You put... Four, you know, your feet and your hands on the door. I'm not going. They push you out. You're falling through the air. The chute opens. You go, I survived somehow, but you're scared. So you make it to the ground. You go, oh, my God, I can't believe I survived that. I'm never doing that again. They go, suit up. We're going back up. You go, I can't do this. That's okay. You're going. And they force you. And after about nine times of shoving you out the door, the tenth time, you start to recognize, I'm going out whether I like it or not, but I don't like being shoved. So I'll tell you what. You say, don't push this time. I'll, I'll jump. That's your first step. I'll, I'll jump. Don't push. Please, please don't push me. That freaks me out. So you go, they go jump, and you go, right? Somehow you survive. Now, they do that to you until you're about time number 50, because they're going to do it about 100 times. And when they get to time 50... They go, jump, and you go, whatever, you're over it. Now jumping's no big deal. You're just over it. You're just, okay, I've jumped 50 times. I'm over it. I, you know, I've survived. I really don't care anymore. I'll just do it because I just don't want to be pushed. You're over it. Now, it's not scary. It's not scary at all. It's kind of a normal thing now. So I want to tell you something. When you go out in public and you... Uh, meet people that you don't know and encounter people that are strangers and wonder, how, how is this going to work out? Maybe they will look at me, you know, in a, in, a, in a way that will be intimidating. Maybe they'll say bad words to me, all this stuff. This is a very simple procedure here, is if you do it 10 times, just pick a number, you get over it. And suddenly, it's not a big deal. It is nothing. I can walk up to anybody. There's no fear. Now, I'm an introvert. Before I did this, before I understood that I had the power in me to heal people and actually saw it happening, before I did that, I didn't walk up to any strangers ever. I wasn't that kind of a person. I was an introvert. I don't talk to strangers. You know, I could stand in a, back in the days where we stood in bank lines. Now it's all automatically put in. I'd stand there and there'd be all these people in line and I wouldn't talk to a single soul. And my, I had a, my best friend, was, he'd be behind me sometimes. He'd go in the same line. He'd talk to every, by the end of the line, he'd know everybody. I never talked to anybody. But now, I have no fear. I have no fear. I can talk to anybody. I can walk up to anybody. So I was in 
Uh, there's a man here. Larry, where are you? Wait, raise your hand. There he is. Hi, Larry. Now, this man happened to be in the first out-of-state meeting I ever did. It's a number of years ago. And, and he was a witness to a lot of this stuff. This, there was this guy named Will that there was this uh, large uh, black Baptist man who got brought to this first time I was teaching at this church in Michigan. And his name was Will. And at the end of my teaching on the Friday night, I thought we were just going to go and have some food. And the pastor said, no, we're going to have healing service. I go, okay, fine, we'll have healing service. And you're on, Tom. And it's like, I'm on? Yeah. And uh, so basically, who's got the worst case in this whole place? Bring them up. Tom's going to heal them. No pressure. Anyway, there was this guy in the back. His name was Will, big black guy. And he uh, stands up and basically, I've got the worst case. And he's, he had all kinds of things wrong with him. And he had something wrong. I don't know if it was his heart or his lungs, but he could not walk four or five steps and be completely winded. Do you know what was wrong with him, Larry? Respiratory? Yeah. So anyway, this guy can barely breathe. He's got back problems. He's got pains and aches everywhere. And now that's, that's just part of it. But the other part was this. Basically, Will's letting me know. And I'm a Baptist, and I don't even believe in this stuff. And he goes, and my boss dragged me here, Larry. Larry brought this guy. So they bring him up, and I'm going, no pressure. Well, I prayed for Will. And I said, Will, he walked up the aisle, and it took him a while because he was, <gasps> so I prayed for him, and I go, try it out, Will. He walks up and back the aisle, and he goes, seems okay. I go, walk up and down the stairs. He walks up. I said, walk around the block. He walks around the block. The next day, Will is out with me at a mall, and he's praying for people. They're getting healed, 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 healed. And then the last day of the thing, on a Sunday, uh, Will comes running downstairs to me. I was in this church having they had lunch and downstairs. And he comes running to me. He goes, Tom, I, I got healed. And I go, yeah, I know. I was there. And he goes, no, you don't understand. He goes, look, my glasses are off. I have terrible vision. I could see 20-20. I said, I said, how'd that happen, Will? He said, well, a little boy prayed for me upstairs. I go, a little boy. Now, if you look on my videos, you will see the little boy, everything, because everything I tell you, it's on a video. Everything, Okay. You'll see this. Uh, look on a uh, video and just look up the word Michigan. You'll find this. This little boy is three years old. So I walk up. I said, show me this little boy. I walk upstairs with Will. He goes, that's the little boy right there. I go up to this little boy. I said, did you pray for this man for his eyes? He goes, yeah. I go, what did you say? I want to know how you did this. He said, I said, bad eyes? I don't like you. He was healed just like that. <laughs> is that right? It's true, isn't it, Larry? Yeah, but anyway, at that same trip, Michigan, uh, we split up on the Saturday, and we took people out to a mall, a big mall in Michigan, and, um, and so I, you know, I, I said, well, you know, you look like you could lead some folks, because you, you kind of got the hang of this, and so you be a leader, you be a leader, you be a leader, be a leader, and I had the leftovers, which were like four little old ladies that were scared to death. They go, we're going to give you the scared ones, so I got all the scared ones. I got these four little old ladies scared to death. And so we're in this mall, and we see a gang. I mean, a real gang, a legitimate gang. Could have been the, the Bloods or the Crips, seriously. And they got their pants, you know, their, hand, their top of the pants is down to here. They're all hanging there. It's backwards, chains, necks all tattooed. And they're all sitting there. And the gang, there's a big group of them, probably about 10 of them, in a circle in the food court. And I look at them and I go, that's where we're going right there. These little old ladies, ah, no, no, we can't go near them. No, no, no. I go, that's where we're going right there because we got to get you over your fears here. So I said, just come on with me. They go, no, no. I go, it'll be all right. Come on, come on. So I get them over there, step right in the middle of this group of guys. And they're all looking at me like, what do you want? I say, hi, I'm Tom. These are my friends. We pray for people and God heals people. They're like, you do what? Look, anybody here got pain? This one guy, well, I got a little pain in my elbow. I go, watch this. 
grab one of these little old ladies, pray for him, gets healed. Next thing you know, they're going, ooh, I got a bad knee, I got a bad ankle, I got a bad back. They all start getting healed, right? At the end of it, they're hugging us all. We're telling them about God. They're hugging us. And at the end, when we want to leave and say, thanks, guys, for letting us pray for you, they go, no, no, you're not leaving. Why? They go, we're going to have a prayer circle here. We all got to be, it's on the video. Too. We got a big circle and all these gang guys, they're praying to Jesus. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for what you've done. See, your fears are mostly in your head. And you'll get over it if you just do it. You got to do it and then you'll get over it. When you get over it, it gets fun. Then you can walk up to anybody. There's one video, the people that, there's some people here have watched a lot of my videos. So a lot of people, um, probably one of the favorite videos people have is about this, uh, this, uh, oh gosh, I just forgot his name. It's, it's not Danny, but anyway. Bobby, you know, who said, did you say that? Bobby, it's Bobby. So anyway, I'm walking past this parking garage, and I see this, I'm done praying for, for people for the day. I just took a group out on a Thursday. And I'm walking, and I'm going back to my car, and I look, and I see this kid off to my right in the parking garage. And uh, he's, he's got a shirt with all kinds of satanic symbols all over it. It's got pentagrams and Ouija board. It's got everything on it. It's satanic, you can imagine. You know, he's got all these tattoos, all these ear gaugings. He's, and he's the guy you'd look at and go, he looks like a Christian. Well, he didn't. And my, ma my mind said this. My mind said, all that witchcraft stuff, he's not interested in Jesus. And this is what I did. I said, oh, yeah? That's the very reason I'm going is because my mind tried to talk me out of it. You've got to ignore the, what they look like. I go, my mind says he's never going to want Jesus, but I said, that's the very reason I'm going to do it, because that, that's intimidating looking. He looks like he'd be against me. So I walk up to this kid, and I start asking him questions, and, and she knows the video. Anyway, he had problems with his legs. I just pointed at his legs. I just went like this, two legs. I said, be healed right now. He got totally healed. And then he goes, that's crazy. That's, that's I don't understand. I said, that's because Jesus loves you. At the end of the video, this kid is crying tears. He's given his life to Jesus because Jesus touched him. So don't be afraid of the outside. Don't be afraid of what things look like. You've got to step out there. Now, why can you step out there? Okay, I'm going to show you something. I would like you to open to 1 Corinthians 13, 11 through 13. 1 Corinthians 11 through 13. All right. Now, it says this. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully just as I have also been fully known. But now faith, hope, love, abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. I want to focus on something. When I got saved... People mostly just read King James. That's a long time ago. That was just the Bible that people had. So in this particular verse, it says, but now we look through a glass darkly in the King James. So I had always pictured this as meaning something that it didn't mean at all. I said, we look through a glass darkly. We know in part. And looking through a glass darkly means this. It's kind of like the window pane I'm looking through is really obscured. Maybe it's really dirty. Maybe it's tinted to where I can barely see the spirit realm on the other side. So we get a glimpse of the spirit realm. We get an idea about it, but it's not as clear as it will be when we see Jesus face to face. That's what I thought it meant. But then I started to study the Greek and realized this word that was glass, that's an old English translation because back in the days of King James, they called a mirror a looking glass. You ever heard of Alice in the Looking Glass? So it wasn't a piece of glass. It was a mirror. And in fact, this is a Greek word, esoptron. Esoptron, which is a highly polished piece of bronze. So it doesn't give you a, a mirror image like we see. It's darker because bronze is darker. So it gives you a picture of yourself, though. Now, the question is this. What do you see when you look into a mirror? Anybody? Exactly. You see yourself. Now, what this word says is, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but them face to face. 
Now, I want you to connect that with another scripture, which is James 1, 23 through 25. Okay? James 1, 23 through 25. It says this, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. It's the same word, esoptron. Same word. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, that man will be blessed in what he does. All right? So I want you to understand these two scriptures and connecting them together. We realize that we look at this point, we look in a mirror, we do look in a mirror darkly, and this one is talking about looking in that mirror. It says, anyone here, here of the word, he's like a man who looks into a mirror, it's the same word. And once he's looked at himself, it's showing he's looking at himself. He walks away and forgets what he sees, right? Here's the point. The Word of God is likened to the mirror. The Word is the mirror. And what that means is the image of you that is a true image. Mirrors don't lie, by the way. Mirrors don't put marks on your face that aren't there. Mirrors don't rearrange your face. Mirrors just reflect what is actually there. The Word of God is your mirror that shows you who you are. And if you look at the Word and believe what it says about who you are, then you will realize who you actually are. And every other thing, every person on the street that tells you, you know, you've got a big smudge on your face, but you go and look in the mirror and go, I don't actually. Every other opinion doesn't matter any longer. What matters is the mirror. The Word of God tells you who you are. You look into the Word to find your identity. You look into the Word to see what it says about you. And what the Word says about you is things that you will even argue with. But when you argue with God, that's the height of arrogance. And you say, well, I want to be humble. I'm just a lowly worm. God says, that's not what you are. You think you're being humble. Actually, you're going against what I have told you in my Word. I say you're the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I say you're the sons of God. I say you're a kings and priests before God. Really? I say that you're more than an overcomer. You're a victor. You're not a victim. You're more than a conqueror. Yeah, but I don't see that. Are you going to argue with God? Is the clay going to argue with the potter? That's what we do. We said, no, I, I, no, I'm not. I can't be all that. No, I, I'm not that good. I'm not this. I'm not that. I'm not that powerful. I don't have that. I'm not that holy. And all this stuff, God says, wait a minute. Don't disagree with what I've called you. I've called you the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. I've called you the saints of God and of the household of faith. I've called you these things, and you're arguing with a mirror. Don't argue with a mirror. Receive it. You say, but that seems like a, a high, lofty view that God has of me. He does, because he's made you brand new creations. And he's made you to carry his spirit. You see, here's the thing. In the Old Testament, uh, there are many times they turned against God, okay, and followed their own ways. They, and they would worship Baal and Ashtaroth and all kinds of other false gods. That's what they would do. They'd all, children of Israel were always going astray. And the temple would fall into disrepair. Or the temple would have Dagon's, uh, you know, this fish god standing up in the temple in place of God's, you know, ark. And God would finally allow them, the children of Israel, to fall into captivity to their enemies. And they would finally cry out and go, Lord, we'll turn back. Just help us. So he'd help them, and they'd reestablish the temple. And he said, you need to clean the temple out. You need to go to the temple and clean it out. You need to take out all those idols. You need to re-sanctify it. You need to rededicate it. And they would sprinkle blood and go through ceremonies to cleanse the temple so they can put it back into service for God, right? You had to cleanse the temple before the Spirit of God was going to show up again. You had to do that, Okay. So they get the temple all cleansed the way it was direct, they were directed to do, the sprinkling of the blood, the sacrifice of animals. They do all that, get the temple all cleansed, and then they could, they could start the, uh, you know, the evening sacrifice. They could, they could have the, the ark could be in its place and all those things, and it could go back to the way it should be. So men, priests, had to clean up the temple before God's presence would be restored to the temple. Do you get that? All right. So I want you to know, we are on, they were on this side of the cross. We are on this side of the cross. Okay? Things are different. You see, men sanctified the temple to make it holy so God's presence could be there. It doesn't work that way on this side of the cross. On this side of the cross, 
God's Spirit comes into the temple, and His presence sanctifies the temple and makes you holy. The fact that He's in you makes you holy, okay? He brings His holiness in you. He cleanses your temple. He's the one that washes away your sins. Men don't do it. He does it. He makes you holy so that He can dwell in you, because if you're not holy, He can't dwell in you, but He made you holy so He could dwell in you. You say, yeah, but you don't know the stuff I think. Well, you know what? That's part of your understanding, the difference between the new man and the old man. You're a new creation, and the devil doesn't want you to know that. He wants you to think you're still the same old guy. Because when God saves you, what he doesn't do is erase your memory. So you have all these old thoughts, these old patterns. And that's where you need to renew your mind and begin to change the way you're acting. Because the way you are actually in God's sight is you're a new creation, you're a new person. But you still have some of these old ways and thoughts. That's what the Bible says. You need to put off the old man. Because the old man might be dead, but he sure talks a lot for a dead guy. Right? See, the thing about death is, death is, uh, depends on what you think that means. The old man is dead. Okay? You go, but he's still talking. How come this dead guy's talking? We have a picture of death in a very natural sense. We think it's a cessation of life, and so once somebody's dead, they don't do anything anymore. They don't talk. They just lay there. Well, this dead man, he talks. Because in the Bible, death, uh, there's different kinds of death, okay? There's a spiritual death and there's a physical death. Uh, those that do not receive Jesus, they have the second death, which is a spiritual death. But what death means in this sense is it's a separation from God, all right? So your old man has died with Christ. He says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me, Right? So the old man has been crucified with Christ. He's been nailed to the cross with Christ. He's been buried in water, baptism with Christ. But there's a new man that's been resurrected. But the old man's still talking. Well, you know what? He, he isn't dead in the sense of uh, he's been demolished, he's, he's, he's been dissolved, and he doesn't exist. He's dead in the sense he's separated from God. But the new man is one with God because it says when we are joined to the Lord, we become one spirit with him. So you're going to find in your life, you're going to have a battle. It's just part of, Paul talks about this battle, a battle between the old you and the new you, and you've got to start identifying the new you is really who you are, the old you is who you were. And when the devil says, you're really this, you go, no, I was that, but now I'm this. See, I am who God says I am. I am who God says I am. You go, but I don't feel like it. It doesn't matter if you feel like it. You are who God says you are. I had a man ask me just this morning, he had an issue, which many of you are going to have. He said, well, you know, so I have this, this, these voices condemn me all the time that, you know, maybe I blew up on, as I'm driving, I got upset at somebody, or maybe I looked at somebody the wrong way, and, and it condemns me saying, now, now you won't have the power, now you're not holy, now you can't do these things, okay? And I said, yeah, I understand that. So here's, here's what that's about. That's about you believing what you're hearing, but not believing what the Word says, because here's the thing, is... We established last night something, two points. You are the sons and daughters of God right now, okay? Number two, you are citizens of the heavenly kingdom and have all the rights of a citizen of the kingdom. When you have all the rights, you have all the authority that goes with that. You have all authority. You have authority over sickness. You have authority over the devils. You even have authority over the natural things of this earth. That's amazing. Maybe it's a stretch of your faith. Maybe you've got to keep stretching yourself in that area to see results. But you have authority. That's who you are. So what happens to people is they have a bad day, and they, you know, they set a swear word on the freeway, and they feel like, oh, now I can't. Now if I pray for anybody, nothing's going to happen. Who told you that? See, I'll tell you what the problem is. The problem is, is you don't realize something that's really very logical, is whoever you are today, whatever your name is, if you go off on somebody and have a bad attitude, your name doesn't change. You still are the same person. You may have to... Uh, you know, amend the way you're acting. You may have to discipline yourself a little bit, but you're not a different person. So what people have believed is that it's like the Old Testament. You see, David used to pray a prayer that we don't have to pray anymore because he was on this side of the cross. He'd say, Lord, uh, renew in me a right spirit, and it, re, not right heart. And he goes, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. We don't have to pray that. God's gonna, not going to take his Holy Spirit from us because we have the Holy Spirit on the inside. See, the Holy Spirit came upon people in those days. Holy Spirit walked with people in those days, but He's in us. And He says, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. 
So you're a son right now. You go, well, you, you, I had a bad thought. Okay, you're a son with a bad thought. You're still a son. It doesn't change that you're a son. Well, now I can't pray for people. Why? You're still a son. Sons have power. Sons have authority. But I can't. So one time I made a video. You'll have to look it up. I don't remember the name, but it was a video where I said, I'm going to prove something. Okay, so I said to this man today, I said, I said, do you have any uh, parents living? He says, my mother's living. I said, so if you call your mom up today and say, mom, I don't feel like I'm your son today, what's she going to say to you? You're nuts. What do you mean you don't feel like it? I don't feel it. I feel like I'm a not a good person. I'm not your son. It's like, well, I don't care what you feel like. Biology says you are. DNA says you are. You say, I don't feel like I'm very holy. I don't feel like I'm a son of God. I don't feel saved today. That's a feeling. That's not the truth. The truth is you are who God says you are, right? So I had this one video I did where uh, I had a bad attitude. And I said, I'm going to make this video just to prove a point because some people are waiting for the anointing to come upon them before they can do the things of God before they can pray for people. They're waiting for some feeling before they can pray for people. They're waiting because they think if I fast for 10 days, I can pray for people, but if I don't, I can't. They, think, they have all these things that they think they need to do, but they have to understand you are who you are no matter what, and it doesn't change. So I made this one video where I was really upset, and I said, okay. I said, here's the video. I'm making this video today just to prove a point. I said, I feel really cranky today. I've had a bad day. I've had bad stuff happen, and I'm just ticked off. It was a bad attitude video. So I got a bad attitude video. I go, I go, I don't feel like praying for people. I really couldn't care less today. I just want to go home and just, you know, just unwind, forget about today. I said, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what I don't feel like doing. I'm going to go out and pray for people. They're going to get healed anyway. And so I said, I just have to prove a point. It's not about I don't feel the spirit right now, so I can't do it. That's in your head. Whether you feel it or don't feel it, remember this. We don't walk by sight but by faith. You are who you are no matter what. You have what you have. God doesn't take it away from you. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. means he doesn't take them away from you. He gives them to you. They're yours. If they stop working, it's because you shelved them. You can bring them right back off the shelf and use them again because he never took them away. So I've got this bad attitude, and I'm going to make a video. And I'm just driving in my car, and I go, so I'm looking for somebody I'm going to pray for right now. And I really don't want to, but I'm going to do it anyway. So I'm driving around, and I see this guy at a, at a bus stop with crutches, and I go, that guy, he's my first target. Really don't care about the guy right now. I don't feel loving right now. I don't feel very Christian right now. So I go to this guy with the crutch, and I go, so uh, what happened to you, dude? He's like, well, a truck backed over my leg. I go, nonsense. <laughs> In Jesus' name, be healed. I said, put those crutches, give me those crutches. He's like, what? What? Go walk. He starts walking. He's like. I go, take these crutches. He goes, what am I going to do with them? I go, I'll sell them. I don't care. I just took off. Bad attitude. But he was healed. He was like. I gave him my card, though. He's going past his crosswalk. There's a little old lady with a cane walking like this. I said, she's next. So what's wrong with you? Oh, I got arthritis in my hips. I got bad knees. I got, oh, well. In Jesus' name, be healed, lady, you know. Oh, now try it. She goes, oh, the pain's gone. Okay, see you later. Whew. So my last stop, and this one, um, you'll see this video of this one guy. His name's Dwayne. You look up a video. It says, hit by a car. That's, it's in the video, hit by a car. Some of you know that one. So this guy, Dwayne. So I find this guy at this bus station, this trans where they have all these buses come. And uh, he's got this big cast on his leg, his arms all mangled. He's all, I said, so what happened to you, man? He goes, I was run over by a car. I was a pedestrian. Oh, yeah? So how bad is it? <laughs> like, oh, oh well, I've got 23 fractures in my foot, you know. Uh, I've got this knee thing. I've got this uh, pin, they, metal pins in my arm. I've got my back problem. He's got all these problems, and you'll see it on the video. I just start praying from one by one by one. He got healed of everything, walks out with a, out the cast. He's completely, he's like, I did it to prove a point. It had nothing to do with my feelings. Nothing. Because I know who I am. If you know who you are, then you can do what God says you can do. If you know who you are and what you have, you're fully armed and loaded and ready for everything. And it doesn't change depending on your feelings. Some people think, I cannot minister healing unless I feel the anointing. And so, 
You'll find people like Smith Wigglesworth, he used to walk around sometimes on stage for like an hour and people would be bored to death. He's like, he's not even talking. He's like this. He's waiting to feel the anointing. Finally, boom, the anointing hits. He's like, okay, I'm ready to pray for people. And you know what? Then they got healed. And you might go, well, that, that's a model for me. I need to wait for the anointing. No, that was just Smith Wigglesworth's uh, belief. And you know what? Uh, according to your faith, so be it unto you. You see, he was waiting for a feeling, and when he had the feeling, he was confident it would work. If you get the feeling, you'll probably be more confident it'll work. But you have to get to the point to where I can do it even if I don't have the feeling, because that'll work too. If you don't believe you can do it until you have the feeling, then you will never do it until you have the feeling. I remember one time Curry Blake was uh, teaching, and he, he called it like the Benadryl anointing, I think he called it, for some of these people heard that. So Curry Blake, somebody, he had some allergy or something at some point, he's preached somewhere, and he'd never taken a Benadryl, and somebody gave him a Benadryl, and it, he didn't realize it made him a little bit woozy in the head, a little bit foggy in the head, and he thought it was the anointing. He's like, whoa, I, f well, I feel the anointing, bring the people up, and suddenly everybody's getting healed. And he's like, I feel the anointing, I'm ready, and he starts praying for it, and then he realized later, that was Benadryl I was feeling, but his confidence was, if I feel this, I can heal. You don't need to feel anything. You need to know who you are. You need to know what you have. When the devil says, you can't do it, you need to say, shut up. Your natural mind will fall for the devil's lies. You need to tell your natural mind to sit in the corner because you're doing spiritual work. You don't need its help. Because your natural mind is hostile towards God. Your natural mind doesn't understand a whole lot of spiritual things and don't expect it to ever understand. Don't think you're ever going to ride that zebra long enough for it to become tame. It's never going to happen. Just understand, when you're doing the things of the Spirit, you have to be shifted into walking in the Spirit of who you, who you are. I have people that come in my office all the time, and they, they're going to tell me, I have a million problems, I want you to help me. And I always say the same thing, and they think it's like some revelation I got. It's like, no, I just say that to everybody. Everybody walks in, I go, here's your problem. You don't know who you are or what you have. Really? Is that it? Yeah. I say that no matter what's wrong. Because that's really the root of it all. They don't know who they are or what they have. Because if they knew who they were and what they had, they wouldn't have these problems. So you have to begin to say, I'm going to stop arguing with my master. And I'm going to start agreeing with what he says. He says, I'm a child of God. He says, these signs shall follow them that believe. I'm a believer. He says, I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. That's what he says. He says that I will do the works that he did in greater works. He said that. Well, he was talking about just a few people. He said, all of us, believers, children of God, the mirror is the Word of God. Look at the mirror of the Word of God, and you're going to find the Word of God says a whole lot of things about you that you wouldn't say about you. Okay? Uh, the, 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 your, your, your own mind will say, I'm a slave, and, and the Lord says, no, actually, you're free. Uh, the mind will say you're a loser, and, and God's Word will say, no, you're a champion, right? The, the, the mind will say, I'm helpless, and, and the Word will say, no, you have power. You have power, right? Um, the mind will say, you're a sinner, and you have to say, no, I'm a saint, because God says so. God calls you a saint, doesn't he? Um, the mind says, you're a beggar, and, and the Word of God says, no, you're a son of a king, and you're an heir of the king. Oh, that doesn't feel right. Oh, you're waiting for feelings then, aren't you? Stop waiting for feelings. Start operating in what the Word says. Take it like it's true because it is true. Let God be true. Let every man be a liar. Let every devil be a liar. Let every everything be a liar. But God is still true. Okay? Now, we're going to get into some practical because I want you to know how to operate in power because it's a great testimony that God is alive. It's a great testimony that God cares. It's a great testimony that God is still reaching out to people. It's a great testimony that God is still working through His people. It's not something that happened in the past and that, that ended. He's still working through His people with power today. He's given you power. You may not know how to use the power, but it's there waiting for you to learn how to use it. Okay? I had a man ask me today a question. I, I'll, I'll open this up at one point here today before we go out for some questions, okay? Um, what time are we going to the lunch thing? 
so it's whatever. Fine. Okay, good. Because I want to make sure I cover a few things. All right. So one ask, one man asked me a question, and you'll have a lot of questions. I'll let you ask them all. But uh, one question was, he says, you know, I, I've been having some success praying for people for healing, but my own family, it's been really hard. On my, with, like, I don't see it when I pray for my own family. Okay? I have some people that will call me, you know, let's say one person on the East Coast, one person on the West Coast, and they'll tell me their reality. They'll say, on the West Coast, they'll say, Pastor Tom, I've got this issue. Every Christian I pray for gets healed, but when I pray for non-Christians, they don't get healed. Then I get a call from the other coast, East Coast. Pastor Tom, I have this problem. Every non-Christian I pray for gets healed, and every Christian doesn't get healed. And I go, that's true for you. And they go, what do, what do you mean? Because that's what you believe. You've created a box for yourself, and you've seen, you've started, see your natural, you've let your natural mind take over and make patterns out of things. So if three people in a row do a certain thing, you go, oh, that's the way it is. There's no pattern. There's no box. Get rid of the box. Anything that says, because what happens is you'll go out one Tuesday and have a really good day, and you'll start to assume, I think this works better on Tuesdays. And then you realize you go out all, every Tuesday, and you find between two and three it works the best. I found out healing works the best on Tuesdays between two and three. You just created a smaller, smaller, smaller box. You've got to throw the box out and say, there is no limit. There is no limit to what God does. There is no limit on what I can do with God in me. There's no limit. But, but I've found it only works for Christians. That's because you have saw a little pattern you thought, and your mind says, I've settled on a pattern. This is the way it is. And you started to believe that. If you start to believe that, that's what it will be. You've got, so I tell the people, throw the pattern out. Just throw it out. It's not true. I had a guy. Um, this guy started walking in this thing, and he right off the bat was doing some outrageously huge miracles. I mean, there were, I was like, dude, you really took the ball and ran. And it was like, bam, bam, huge miracles, fantastic miracles. And then one day, he calls me. He says, it all stopped. It's gone. I, I don't know. I pray for people. Nothing's happening now. I don't, I don't understand what happened. And I said, it's in your head. It's just your head. He goes, no, I was praying one day, and it was all working. And the next day, nothing. I go, it's in your head. Nothing's changed. He goes, well, it, it's not working. I go, nothing has changed. What's changed is you believe this. I go, you need to go back to doing what you're doing and just ignore what happened one day. He's like, but it isn't working. I go, it's in your head because you're still the same person. God hasn't taken anything away from you, and nothing has changed. So he goes, well, okay. He went back. It all came right back. You can let your head get the best of you, and that's where the devil fights you, as we saw last night. He fights you in your mind. And he tells you, I don't think it'll work for you today. You're not a good enough person today. You're not holy enough today. You haven't fasted enough today. You didn't read the Bible enough today. You didn't, you didn't pray enough today. There's all kinds of reasons that you'll go, yeah, you're right. Say, wait a minute, none of that changes who I am. I am who I am. I have what God says I have, always. That's why you can be instant in season and out of season, because nothing changes. Okay? If you believe it's changed, you'll start believing. I said to this man, I said, well, Here's the reason usually why you pray for your family and you're not seeing it, okay? It's because when you're praying for a stranger, it's really easy to be very objective and keep your emotion out of it. Like, I'm so concerned. It's my child. I really want them. See, that's kind of a worry. That's kind of an anxiety. I, it, everything depends on this healing happening. You're actually worrying about it as you're praying. It's a doubt. If you can get yourself neutral, neutral for a moment, and just pray neutrally like this is just another person and not be so bound up in your heart in it, you'll find it works. Because, see, when you get doubt in there, worry in there, anxiety in there, you're not walking in faith. Faith doesn't have those things. Faith says, well, God said it, so it'll work. So there are reasons we can get ourselves thinking there's a pattern. It only works for some people or it works this way. So the people that I've had tell me, say, it only works for Christians, I say, okay, here's the truth. That's all in your head. It's not true. They'll say, okay, I'll, I'll try that. They go out and say, you're right, it worked. Yeah. You can let your head get you in a box. Don't let God be put in a box. Okay? You can also be put in a box saying, well, I can only heal this but not that. You know what? The first time I prayed for a cancer and ha had it instantly healed, I wasn't ready for it. It was a long time ago. This woman came up to me. She looked completely healthy. I go, this will be an easy one. She's probably got a pain in her back. No big deal. She goes, breast cancer. And here's, she also had a lump on her arm, cancer. And I'm going, ooh, that's the big one. Cancer, it's a big one. I wasn't ready, I thought. But I was like, 
shake your head, just push that out, just do it. Prayed for her. She was instantly healed. I said, go to the doctor, get me the paperwork. She brought me the paperwork. I've got that on video too. Paperwork, completely cancer-free. In fact, when she went to the doctor the first time to check it out, they did not believe their results. They said, we've made a mistake. Something's wrong here. They said, we're taking you back again and doing full every kind of test we can do. And she still came back with the paper, cancer-free. I didn't think I was ready, but God says, I want to stretch you. Just put your head out of the way and do this. You see people in a wheelchair? That's too big. Who says it's too big? I remember there's a video I have that's called the three-inch miracle. So I was going up to Canada to teach at a camp. And uh, it was an hour and a half ride on this ferry. So I'm on this ferry, and I'm with my wife and my mother-in-law and, and a young lady from our church. They were with me. And they're sitting there chatting. I'm getting bored. <laughs> so I go, I'm going to find somebody to practice on while I'm waiting. So I'm walking on this ferry, and uh, there's this lady named Alice, and she's got this crutch or this cane, and it's got four prongs on it to make it really steady. And she's walking really awfully, just like, and I'm thinking, I think she's got a problem. I don't know what it is, but she's got some kind of problem. So I went over to her. She's about, she was 77 years old. I said, excuse me, I noticed you're having a little difficulty walking. Can I ask what's going on there? So, well, when I was seven years old, broke my leg, they said it wrong, and I got one leg that's three inches shorter than the other, okay? So, three inches, I want to show you. That much. I like that. Now, I said in my head, three inches. I've done an inch and a half. That's double what I've ever done. And for a moment, I said, that's bigger than my faith has ever been, because I, I can do an inch and a half now. I've done that. And the Lord spoke to me and said, if the inch and a half is real and it's a miracle, then three inches is no difference. Okay. So I said, uh, I, I can pray for you, and I believe God will grow your leg out. And I'm just freaked out in my head, like, I've never seen anything that big. So I sat her down, and uh, I held up her legs, and then I saw them with my own eyes, and it was intimidating. It's like, wow, that's a lot, lady. She goes, been that way for 70 years. 70 years. Okay, I'm going to pray. So I was ready to say my stuff, you know. Uh, in Jesus' name, leg come out, whatever I was going to say. And I didn't get a chance to. I was ready to say in Jesus' name, and I probably got it. And it went, bam, three inches. I go, did you see that? She goes, yeah, I saw that. I was more freaked out than she was. And I'm going, that was a miracle. <laughs> She's like, yeah. She seems not that really excited. She's like, oh, yeah. I'm going, She's a Methodist. She got to be freaked out. <laughs> so I said, so then I'm all thinking, about, I just saw, I mean, three inches, it was like a shotgun. Bam, it three inches shot out like a, wow, that's the power of God. So I felt like. Okay, I'm going to make this monumental. I'm going to do like they did at the gate called Beautiful. I'm going to say, rise up and walk, and she's going to walk like a champ. I'm just taking the next step. See her walking with no cane perfectly. That's what I thought. That's the way I would have written it if it was a Hollywood movie. She'd walk perfectly. Da 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 da. There it is. It is not what happened. I said, stand up and walk, lady. She couldn't walk at all. She was like, my leg's too long. <laughs> she had to relearn how to walk. So she, she wasn't used to a leg that long. She'd been used to swinging that thing, and it always cleared. So then uh, I go and I tell my mother-in-law, my, my wife and, and this, this young lady, and they go, take us to her. We want to meet this woman. They, like, they could hardly believe this. I go, okay. So I walk around the ferry. And I find Alice, and she's sitting, sitting by a window, looking out the window, and she's like, she's like this, looking out the window. I said, that's her. I said, Alice, tell him. Oh, yeah. He grew the leg out three inches. She doesn't even seem that excited about it. And, uh, but she does this. She goes, you see this? We go, yeah. She goes, I've never been able to do that. <laughs> she, was, she thought it was great. She could cross her legs now. 
point is this. Don't limit God. Don't let the challenge cause you to back down. Be a David. Say, yeah, that's Goliath, but God's on my side. Yeah, that's a wheelchair, but God's on my side. You know what I've even done? Because I saw, I saw one time, I saw Todd White do this in a video. I go, I'm going to do that. Todd White went up to a guy, and I've done this myself, in a wheelchair with legs cut off completely. He had just had a stump. Todd White says, you know, I've never seen this before, but I'd like to see a leg grow out. If you'll let me pray, can I do that? He says, sure, take a shot. Prayed, didn't happen. He said, thanks for letting me pray. I'm going to do that until it happens. I started doing that. Don't let anything intimidate you. It's like, you know what? If I don't pray for that, I'm never going to see it. So I'm going to pray for it. And you know what? I prayed for a guy with no leg, and, and you know what? It didn't happen. And then one time, I've had this happen twice, actually. One time, I'm watching this guy, and he's limping. And I'm going, hey, uh, something wrong with your leg there. I can pray for you, and God will heal it. And he pulls up his pants, and he's got a fake leg. I mean, oh, this is a big one. And it's from the knee down. You know, it's fake. And I'm saying, well, what do I do now? You know, because that's not a real leg. You can't heal that thing. Um, but I said, well, have you got any pain in that thing? You know? And he's like, yeah, actually, where my, my stub here connects to the thing, I always have this excruciating pain all the time. It's like sore there. I go, okay. I prayed for that. He got healed. You know what? Take what you got. Just go for it. <laughs> Step out there in faith. Okay. So some nuts and bolts principles. Sir, would you? Come up here for me. You can stand here because you're so tall. What's your name? Ross. This is Ross. I just met Ross. Anyway, Ross, I'm going to pretend for a minute that Ross is the person that I'm going to pray for. I'm going to tell you two things right now. Is I'm, I'm going I'm to show you how to functionally pray for a person, have the right mindset and, and the right things to say. But then after this, I'm going to also show you how to approach strangers because you need to know that. Because if you watch my videos, you could watch all those videos. There's like 360 videos, and you'll never see me approaching people because I can't approach them with a the camera going. I have to ask them if it's okay. But you need to know how to approach people. So Carol and I went out yesterday, and so she got to be with me and see the approach quite a few times. And so she gets the picture, right, Carol? Yeah. So anyway, Ross, uh, let's just say I, I've just I've caught this. I say we're going fishing, right? We're going fishing. When you go to the mall, we're going fishing. You go to a state fair, you're going fishing. Because God, uh, Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men, right? And you're fishing for men. So I just got Ross on the line. I just met Ross, and I said, excuse me, sir, uh, do you have any pain in your body? And Ross is like, yeah, I got a bad shoulder, okay, right here. <laughs> we'll see if this happens. I'll, I'll tell you what's happened to me. Like, so many times I've lost count. I usually, because the person standing next to me, the easiest thing for me to put my hand on his shoulder, and I can't tell you how many times I have brought somebody up and said, so, you, you know, if it's a shoulder, you go like, uh, in Jesus' name, blah, 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 and then I'm talking, and the person goes, oh, my gosh. I go, what? They go, I had a bad shoulder. It's healed. Oh, healed by accident. I've had it happen so many times. I was like, really? They go, yeah, I was going to have you pray for that. Anyway, so Ross is here, and he said, Yes, I have a bad shoulder, torn, torn rotator cuff or whatever, okay? I'm going to give you a few really clear pointers on how you're going to pray for this thing. First of all, understand this. You are a son or daughter of God, and you've been given authority to pray, and people will be healed. You've been given authority over all sickness and all disease. You've been given authority over all demonic powers, okay? So don't say you don't have enough because you've got the Holy Spirit in you, and he's enough. He's more than enough. So, I say, Ross, first thing I'm going to do, he's got pain in his shoulder. I'm going to say, Ross, what's your pain level 1 through 10? What is it, Ross? Five. He's got a 5, all right? I need to know that because I need to know if I pray once, did anything happen or did nothing happen or did something halfway happen? I need to know where the starting point is because my ending point is I want a 0. So, he says, it's a 5. So, I say, okay, Ross. Here's what I want you to do. Sometimes these people you're praying for are Christians, okay? So you have to direct them to do this. Sounds weird. Tell them don't pray, okay? Because it, they're causing a conflict here. You're trying to pour out, and they're trying to pour out, and you need them just to receive. They're just going to receive. So you say, don't pray, Ross. Just relax, and I'm going to pray for you, okay? So then I'd speak to the shoulder. Now, here's something that 
Almost everybody does, and I'm going to tell you right off the bat, don't do it, okay? They do this. Watch. Here's what they do. They go, right now I speak to Ross's shoulder. Stop. Don't close your eyes. Okay? You're using authority here. You're not talking to the Father. You're talking to the shoulder. You see, here's what we're not doing. Father, trying to close my eyes to get in contact with the Father. Father, please heal Ross. That is not the way you pray for people to be healed. It doesn't work. He gave you authority. He says, you do it. I've given you authority. You don't ask me to do it. You do it. That's why I gave you the authority. And remember what Peter said? He said, silver, gold, I don't have. But such as I have, I give it unto you. Rise up and walk. So he said, I got something. I got some authority here. So I look at, I look at the thing because the thing is the problem. I go, he's got a bad shoulder here. That's the thing I'm talking to. That's the mountain I need to move right there. So I'm going to look at it like I'm looking at a dog. And I'm going to tell it to obey like I'm talking to a dog. You sit. Stay. Right? So I'm looking at the shoulder, and I say, right now, rotator cuff, be healed now. And I throw in, depending on what I feel like, you know, muscles, tendons, ligaments, nerves, be healed now. And then I say, all pain, leave now. Now is, I use as a trigger that that means now is when I've, I've said, I've released my faith. That's it now, rather than leave. And then, it, you know, if it's a spirit, sometimes these pains are a spirit. Spirit goes, okay, I'll leave. How about tomorrow? No, now. I want to tell you, now is when I want it. Leave now. And then I do what I talked about last night, if you were here last night. I just shut my mind off and just dwell in a place of peace for a few moments. I enter into rest. I just quiet my mind. I do not let the carnal mind interfere because that's where the doubt comes from. That's where you hear the things like, what if it doesn't happen? I'll look like a fool. You need to say, shut up. Silence. Silence. And I just wait for a few moments. And you go, how long do you know to wait? I just wait till I feel like it. That's all. I don't know how long. I just wait till I kind of feel like, okay, that's enough. So I'd say, um, in Jesus' name, rotator cuff be healed. All pain leave now. Right now you're saying, what's he thinking? Nothing. What's he feeling? Nothing usually. They say, okay, Ross, test it out. This is the second step of faith. First step of faith is praying in faith. Second step of faith is saying, I'm willing to have it tested. Rather than, you know, that's great. Go on your way, Ross. We'll see how it is tomorrow. It's like, no, no, no. Right now, let's test it. So Ross moves his arm around, right? Now Ross is going to have... One of three things he's going to say to me. He's going to say, no difference, but that's not usually the case. He may say, well, it's better. Now it's a two instead of a five. Or he may say, like Wes did, it's just gone, 100%. So if he says, it's a, it's, if he says no difference, I'm going to ask if I can pray again because I don't give up that easy. Because I've seen it didn't go the first time, but it went the second time. So you know what? You're in a boxing ring, and you got a boxing match, and you got 12 rounds. Don't quit after the first round. Keep punching. So I pray, and let's say Ross says, hey, it's a two, right? I go, that's awesome. I'm encouraged because I'm in a boxing match, and I've hit the guy, and now he's staggering. He's falling. It's like, I'm going to hit him again while he's going down. It's going down. We're winning. All right, Ross, let me pray for you again. So I say, Heavenly Father, thank you for taking Ross's pain down from a five to a two, but we know you want 100%. All the rest of that pain, leave now. Just like that, like bang. Do the same thing. So go ahead and test it, Ross. And many, many, many times, it's gone completely, okay? Now, I'll give you every scenario one scenario is it's gone completely, Ross is healed. You're done, but you're not done. You see, I don't know if Ross is a Christian or not a Christian. I don't know what Ross's background is. I just met him, okay? But I'm going to ask Ross, I usually say this, after they, they're healed and they're like, wow, it's, wow, it's gone. I say, do you know why that happened? Most of the time they say no. Sometimes if they're Christian, they say, because you prayed. I say, I say, okay, no, this happened because Jesus loves you. He's reaching out to you right now. He wants to let you know he's real. And he cares about you. Like, really? Jesus would do that for me? 
Yes, he would do that for you. He had me intersect you today so that you could let him touch your life. So then I will ask him if I am not sure. I, I say, have you ever asked Christ to come into your heart? Have you ever asked Jesus to save you? I'm going to find out. I'm going to take him as far as I can take him. You will learn after doing this a few times, you, you can read people if the door's still open. If the door slams in your face, you just realize the Word says this, one man plants, another man waters, God gives the increase. Maybe you just planted a seed today, but God will have it watered later, and it will increase later on. Be okay with planting seeds. Be okay with watering seeds. And be okay with bringing them all the way home, too. If they're open to saying, no, I've never accepted Christ in my heart, and say, he's knocking on the door of your heart right now. He wants to come into your life. He wants to save you. Are you willing to make a commitment to him? Right? If he says, yeah, like Bobby did in that parking lot, you say, okay, well, I'll pray a prayer with you. And if you're sincere in your heart, God hears you. And I will lead him. Now, I want you to know it would be good, and uh, you guys... Uh, like I, when I did this in uh, Billings uh, a couple years ago, I encouraged the church people to say, hey, start a fishing club. They started a fishing club. They started going out one day a week and fishing. And they got a big fishing club now. They got people, they do it all the time. And you, it's good to have, this church can supply you with this, and I, I know that the pastor will make it happen if it hasn't happened yet, with something to give these people that is a, someone they can talk to you give them a card from the church. You give them a flyer from the church that says, now that you've received Christ, or if you say, I want to think about it a while, whatever, here's a number, here's a contact, so that you're not just left like a babe in the woods, but I'm giving you a contact that you can call us and talk to us if you want to know more, if you want to come to Christ uh, uh, you know, at a later date, if you want to come to church and be part of a fellowship. You're letting them give, have a contact. You're not just hitting them and running. You give them something they can hold in their hand to say, I know who did this, because I've had people call me months later saying, I kept your card, and I'm calling you back now. Good. So to see. Okay? Now, um, suppose Ross uh, says, well, I'm not really interested in Jesus. And I go, oh, well, then that's a failure. It's not a failure. You sow to seed. You find that Ross will walk away, and he won't, his mind won't settle on what just happened without thinking a lot about it. Those people... I used to hate Christians. They, they always seem like they were uppity people, and they don't, they don't like other people. This person just showed me love. So all they did was show me love. They'll start to think about that. It will start to change their view of what Christians are like. They'll say, Christians are loving people. Christians are kind people. They did it for me, you know, when, when they didn't even know me. They stepped out. Okay? You're sowing good seeds. Go out and sow good seeds. So go out, put the line out of the boat, and fish. Okay? Now, suppose I walked up to Ross, and he goes, here's another thing. I'm going to show you, Ross is going to be the guy that I see in a mall, okay? So I see Ross, and, uh, you know, I take people out sometimes that, like, for example, especially people that have been at, at Bethel, School of Supernatural Ministry, right? And they say this to me. They, they, they tra treasure hunt a lot. I've done treasure hunt. Yeah. So, but they'll go like this. They'll go, um, okay, we're a treasure hunt. I go, sure, we can do that. And then they'll go, I want to be led by the Spirit as to who to go up to. I said, okay, let's do it your way. So we go to the mall, and they're going... Okay, I need a guy in a red hat and a blue shirt. It's not you. It's not you. It's not you. And they go, I need to be led by the Spirit. They go, um, uh, no, not him. Um, and I go, okay, so now we've been doing that for an hour, and you've prayed for nobody. Now we're going to do it my way. See, because I, I have this belief. What's your belief? I believe that God actually knew where I would be on the map at this point in time, and he has somebody cross my path. So everybody I meet is a target. <laughs> I don't have to wait. There, I'm not going to step over 10 dead bodies looking for a guy with a red hat. They're in my way. God knew that intersection would occur. Sometimes I'll come to people, and I'll go to people with a mall, and there's an intersection. And I say, which way should we go? What's the Spirit say? Left or right? They go, I, I, I'm not sure. I go, listen, it doesn't matter which way you go. God already knew which way you go, and he's got somebody waiting at the other end for you. If you try to double cross, you trick him and say, ah, I was going to say left, but I'm going to say right. He knew that. He has the person waiting at that end, too. So anyway, Ross is there. I see him. Now, what am I going to do to engage this person that I've never met in my life, okay? I'll tell you. Here's, I'll just show you how I do it, but then I'm going to tell you the psychology behind all this. I see him. I look at him in the eyes, okay?
okay? And I say, this is, this is what I do. Carol saw it yesterday. I just walk up. I say, excuse me, sir. Can I ask you a question? I said, sure. Most of them will say, sure. If you're polite, they'll usually be polite. So I said, my name's Tom. I'm here with my friend. You know, at that time, yesterday was Carol. I'm here with my friend Carol, and we pray for people, and God heals them. So I just wanted to ask you if you have any pain anywhere in your body. That's a door opener. That's not where I stop. That's just the door opener because that's a good entry point if they have any pain. I'm not asking him to become a Christian. I'm just saying, do you have any pain in your body? And if he says, no, okay, good day, see you later. No, that's not where it stops. He didn't close the door yet. If he says, no, I don't have any pain in my body. Now, we know what I'll do if he says yeah, he has pain. I'll say, let us pray for you. God will heal you. And then we'll do what we just showed you. But if he says, no, I don't have any pain, I could say, oh, now I'm out of things to say. No, I'm not out of things to say. The second thing is this. Is there anything in your life you would like prayer over? Could it be your family? Could it be your finances? Could it be, you know, your marriage, your kids? And many times there is something. I'm trying to get a new job, and, and I'm not sure I'm going to get the job. Let's pray for you for that, right? Or my finances, I'm, you know, I, I, need, I need money. I'm just running out, and I've got a problem. Okay, let's pray for you. Now, I have had people give their life to Jesus just simply because, no joke, I prayed for their aunt across the country because that's all they could think of. Well, my aunt's in the hospital. I'll pray for her. I prayed for her. They were so touched by the love, they gave their heart to Jesus just because they were touched by the love. They didn't see any miracle. They were just touched by the fact a stranger would pray. So I just say to Ross, he says, is there anything I can pray about? And if he says, uh, well, actually, my kid, I have a kid going through a problem. You know, they've got a drug addiction. I say, we're going to pray for him right now. And we just gather around. And I usually put my hands on their shoulders. I'm a touchy-feely person, so. So, you know, I just pray and I say, Father, I just thank you for whatever the person's name is. And right now, Father, I just pray for them. And I just pray that you have your hand upon them for good. And I just uh, take authority over addiction. I break it off in the name of Jesus. And, you know, I just pray. You can pray. Whatever you want to pray. Just pray, showing them that you, you love this uh, this person you're meeting and this person you don't know, you're showing God's love. He cares about that person. And then after you pray the prayer, you say, thank you so much, Ross, for letting me pray for you. And many times they will be moved. And they're like, wow, I can't believe, thank you. I really appreciate that. I, 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 I don't go to church. And, I, and they tell you their story. This is a way to get a door open to enter into their life. And when you get in their life, they'll let you in a little bit then you can find out what you can do to help bring them closer to Jesus, right? Okay. So, uh, I'm going to show you the way I walk up to people. Looks like this. Really looks like just, just exactly like this. Okay. Walking. I'll be with somebody. No. That guy right there. I'll say, excuse me, sir. Um, my name's Tom. It's my friend. And we come here because we pray for people and God heals people. So, I just wanted to ask you, do you have any pain in your body? Now, there's a reason I do it this way, okay? I do it this way because it eliminates a big problem that you have when you approach strangers. And it's a big problem that you have, too, when people approach you. And that is, if they don't get to the point quickly enough, you start to get suspicious. And the shields start to go up, going, okay, what are they trying to sell me? What's, it, what's, the, what's the gimmick? What's the hook? I get the, the answer to what I'm doing out there so much out in the front there's no question. They don't have time to put up the shields because they know exactly what I'm going for. If you do this, if you walk up and you say, hi, man, how you doing? They're going, uh, fine. Nice day, isn't it? Yeah. What's this guy want? What's this guy trying to do? Is he trying to rob me? Their natural mind will begin to process. You don't give it a chance to process because it's like your natural mind. It'll get you in trouble. You give it the answers before it has a chance to process say, my name's Tom. Right away, suddenly this guy can't say I'm a stranger because I just introduced myself. See, if I'm a robber, I'm not going to say, my name's Tom, I'm going to rob you. But if I say, my name's Tom, it means I'm showing that I'm not afraid to let you know who I am. It's like, oh, okay, now I know you. Your name's Tom. I guess we're not strangers because I know your name. And my friends and I, we pray for people. Oh, that's what you're doing. You're, really? You know, I've never had anybody come up to me and want to pray for me. That's unusual. It is unusual. It almost never happens to people. So, you know what happens there is their brain goes on tilt a little bit. It starts to process. You, you do what? You, it, it, 
It doesn't have a chance to shut down because it's not processing. And while it's off guard, you can just keep talking and it starts going, uh, yeah, I do have pain. Suddenly they're in it. They don't even realize it. So we pray for people and God heals them. Do you have any pain in your body? And they're like, well, yeah, but, but good. Let's pray for you. God will take it away before they have a chance to even think much. They're going, okay. And you get a chance to pray for them. Now, um, you can go ahead and sit down, Ross, because I'm going to show you something else about the approach. All right? Now, you, sir, your name, Austin. So, Austin, I'm going to ask you a question, and I want you to answer it to the best of your ability. All right? I want you guys to picture this. There is a football field, and Austin is standing at one end looking at the goal post on the other end. Okay? Under the goal post at the other end is a man with a, a pit bull. Okay? He's got a collar with spikes all over it, a very short leash, and the guy is looking really seriously at you at the other end of the field. And the guy goes down to the dog, goes, <laughs> unlatches that dog, and that dog, like a bullet, comes shooting towards you at the other end. His eyes are fixed on you, and he's coming at 100 miles an hour. What do you do? Okay. All right, that's a normal response. I happen to know, I used to train dogs and actually to take down people. That was a long time ago. And uh, you'll never outrun that dog, ever. <laughs> he will catch you, no problem. He'll run three times as fast as you run. But you'll run. That's what you would do. That's a natural response. Try to climb the goalpost, something, right? Okay, now, why is he running? I guess he's afraid, huh? You afraid? Okay, it's true, isn't it? Now, I'm going to give you the exact same scenario with one little change to it. So, he's standing at the end of the football field. Guy's at the other end. He's got a pit bull on a leash. He goes down on his knee. He whispers in the dog's ear. He unlatches the leash. The dog comes running towards you full blast. The dog's tongue is hanging out and his tail's wagging like this. What are you going to do? He... There you go. You know what? A dog was running at you full blast both times. The only difference was basically the look on the dog's face. He's smiling. The dog's got his tongue out and his tail's wagging. He's smiling. But if he wasn't smiling, you're freaked out. That's the way it is when you meet strangers in the mall. If you look really uptight and tense, they're freaked out. You go, excuse me, can I ask you a question? They're going, no, no, no questions. Stay away from me. Stay away from me. They're like, I, I, I've got to ask you something. It's like, they're going to kill me. You have to look like the dog with his tongue hanging out. You have to say, friendly. Hi, my name's Tom. You got to look, your eyes have to look, you're like you're not freaked out. So maybe you got to fake it till you make it. Just look relaxed. If you're relaxed, they will mirror what you're doing. You look relaxed. You look at ease. You talk to them like you're just saying, hey, do you know where the pennies is in this mall? I mean, it's just a question you're asking, but instead you're saying, do you have any pain in your body? You're making it look so natural. In fact, you're kind of gaslighting them because what you're doing is you're saying something that's completely outrageous to them. You mean somebody's going to pray for me to be healed in a mall that's like never happened? And you're going to act like this is everyday normal stuff. And they're going to, oh, well, I guess it's normal then because they're acting like it's normal. So I guess I shouldn't be freaked out. Uh, okay, I'll go along. That's what happens. They'll mirror what you do. So if you look freaked out, if you look uptight, they're going to get uptight. They're going to get freaked out. If you look like the dog with his tongue hanging out and the tail wagging, they're going to go, hi, how you doing? Okay. So have the right look. Have the right thing to say. When you do pray for them, you're going to speak to that thing in Jesus' name. You're not going to ask God to do it. You're going to look at it with your eyes because it's like you're looking at a dog and you're saying, sit. You're looking at his shoulder. You're saying, be healed. And you're going to take them through the process. Okay? So... Why do we do this? Well, I'll tell you what. First of all, the part you'll learn later, after you've jumped out of the airplane 50 times, you'll learn it's fun. In fact, you'll learn you'll get hooked. You get hooked because after you see enough people set free, after you see the joy on people's face enough times, after you see enough people coming to the kingdom of God, suddenly you go, this is an awesome thing. In fact, this is more fun than anything else I can do. 
Now, my friend Jason Chin did a video many years ago, and it was called, it, it was really, it's like world famous. It was called like Jesus Lands in Disneyland, right? What he did, he had this, he had this desire. He, he used to teach at Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. He would teach the, the uh, treasure hunts. He, he taught that there. And uh, he had this wish. They said, what, what's an outrageous wish you wish you could do? Write this down, do a paper on it. And he said, I wish I could go to Disneyland and just heal, like, crowds of people there. So he had this wish, but he didn't have enough money at the time. So he went down to speak at this church in Anaheim, and they said, hey, while you're here, we're giving you free tickets to Disneyland. So he went, and he made this video. And he got this video, and he's really young at the time. I mean, he's a little bit older now, you know. <laughs> really just a young kid at the time. And it shows him, and they're at Disneyland, all these people in California, all these people are milling around, summer day, it's a beautiful day. And uh, he sees this, this guy with his arm in a cast, young guy, teenager. And Jason's like, let's, let's go talk to that guy. So they go talk to him, find out he's a football player. And he is the star quarterback for the team. And the team has just lost their star quarterback because he broke his arm. And so Jason finds out he's there with his whole team and with the cheerleaders. The whole thing's there. So can we pray for you? And he's with a couple other people. And they're like, well, sure, go ahead. Praise for him. He gets healed. He's going like this. Suddenly, the cheerleaders go, oh, I got bad knees and this and this. And it starts to break out. And Jason starts, it, there's a video out there on YouTube. And, and Jason starts saying, now, you, uh, are you a Christian? And this young girl's like, well, yeah, I am. I go, you can do this too. Go pray for that guy. Pray for that guy. Pray for, there's, suddenly, there's this outbreak in Disneyland. And, I mean, hundreds and hundreds of people are gathering around. They're getting healed in Disneyland. All over the place. All these young people are jumping up and down. They're screaming. And then one person says something I never forgot. They said, they said, this is more fun than any ride in this whole place. So, it is. So, you know, I went to Disney World and did the same thing, right? And you know what? It didn't compare to any of those rides. Those rides were nothing compared to the fun of seeing people healed and set free. It was exciting. It was exhilarating. You really felt like you were living the life of God that He intended for you. Because life... You know, you can ride all the rides, you can get the nice car, you can have all the nice house and all that stuff. And you know what? In the end, it doesn't satisfy. Because there's something in you that God put in you that will only be satisfied with doing His will and being with Him. You know? Only Jesus can satisfy your soul. When you're doing His work, though, you say, that's not me, I'm not one of those people. When you begin to do it, you'll start to realize, I've just become one of those people. Because I like this, because this is awesome, because this is fantastic. And so I have people now all over the world. I mean, I've taught in Australia and England, all kinds of different places, uh, Canada, Mexico. And there's people all over the world that are doing this all the time. And this is how the gospel is being spread, because the power of God is being shown through regular people. Regular people. Because you know what? You could say, well, I'm not all that much. You know what? Um, I'm not that special. You are special. I'm special, you're special, because I'm a child of God. That's pretty special. But you're just as special. Well, only Tom can do that. Oh, no, no, no. Tom's proven it to many people. You can do it too. You can do it. whatever I do, you can do. Okay? I have the gift. I don't have the gift of healing. If I had the gift of healing, all those people I prayed for for 30 years would have been healed. It didn't happen until I just understood my authority and how to use it. I'm just a believer like you. And I could do those things because I'm a believer. And I have the Holy Spirit, so do you. And I've been authorized, and so have you. All right? So, today at some point, we're going to go out different places. I'm not going to orchestrate that part. You guys, uh, I think Pastor Connie and Carol have kind of some ideas on where we're going to go. But I want to do this right now. I want to do this right now. I want to give you room. I want to give you room for all kinds of questions you may have. I want to answer those questions pertaining to doing what we're about to do today, okay? And, uh, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to just cut to the chase on one thing because I always get this question. I'm just going to say this, all right, is I get a question. Some people have been trying this for a while, and they say, I've got this problem, so I'm just going to address this right away. They say, I've got this problem. Is um, I've been praying for people, and I've been seeing stuff happen, but it keeps coming back to certain people. I pray for them, and a week later it comes back. I, I, what am I doing wrong? And I got to show them. I said, okay, so I'm going to show you what's behind the magician's back. Because the devil's a magician. He's got lying signs and wonders. Everything he does is a lie. 
So the devil's hiding something from you. If you saw the trick, how it's done, you go, it's ridiculously simple. Why'd I fall for that? But when you see it in the front, it looks so real. You know, when you see a good magician, it really looks like he makes something appear out of nothing. It really does. But it's a trick. It's just a trick. He doesn't have any magical powers. So I'm going to show you a trick the devil does, okay? So let's just suppose you find somebody, and you're getting all excited. I pray for people, and they get healed. It's so cool. So you pray for this person, some neighbor, and they have a bad back or a bad knee, and you pray for them, and they go, oh, my gosh, all the pain's gone. And you go, yippee, Jesus. And they call you tomorrow, and they say, hate to tell you this, but pain came back. You go, it, it did? Um, um, you're a little bit off guard here. You're just like, um, uh, I'll pray for you again, okay? Okay, so you pray for him again. Pain goes. You go, good, great, fantastic. Okay, it went, good. I still got it. A couple days later, they call back and say, I'm really sorry to tell you the pain came back. You go, what am I doing wrong? What am I doing wrong? I'm doing something wrong because it keeps coming back. It's not sticking. It's like it's not sticking. It keeps coming back, and I don't know what I'm doing wrong. So I'm going to try to change my prayer a little bit. Maybe I need to say it a little more this way. Maybe I need to do it a little bit more that way. Maybe I need to, uh, uh, you know, close my eyes, open my eyes, jump through a hoop, do whatever you need to do. I've got to try it differently because I'm doing something wrong because it's not working. Okay? Well, you've just fallen for a trick, and you've fallen into the devil's trap. And what the devil wants to do is he wants you to get you off of a course that works into something that doesn't work because you're trying to figure it out. So you start pushing all these buttons you shouldn't be pushing and changing everything because it obviously didn't work, so i got to change, i got to change, it change. And you're getting away from the simplicity of the fact you can just speak and it's done. So what is really happening? I'll give you my view on what's really happening, okay? And it works. That doesn't happen to me anymore. I'm not going to say it. it would never happen. It could happen today, but I know what to do about it, okay? But it doesn't pretty much happen anymore. So what happens is this is you pray for somebody, maybe they had a legitimate injury in their back, they really did, they had a slip disc or whatever, and the pain goes, they're healed. And they walk away. Suddenly their 10 is a zero, and they're walking away. And the next day, it's a 10 again. All right, well, here's the thing, is the devil is always going to fight against God's kingdom advancing, all right? And so what the devil can do is he can send a spirit of pain to that spot, even if it's been corrected, that imitates the previous one, but you're going to assume it's the same one, like your prayer didn't work. It's not the same one. It's another spirit imitating that, so you'll be discouraged. And you go, uh, well, I, I thought I got it out, so that pain left, and so I'll pray again. So you pray, and you have authority, so it goes. And the devil sends one another day, because he knows if he does this three days in a row, you're probably going to give up and say, I don't know what I'm doing now. It's not working anymore. And you'll just surrender. So I've had people, I've told people that. I said, listen, just have this mindset. If the devil wants to send a, a false pain the next day, you just have the mindset that, look, if he sends 100, I'm going to cast the 100 into the pit of hell, and they're going to be gone. And you know what? He'll stop. He'll just stop. It'll just stop because he knows you mean business. But if you keep trying to readjust and change the way you do it and all this, he's getting you way off track. So you're making something really complex that's really supposed to be simple. He wants you to be co complex. So, it's, so, so after a while, you've got to write books on how to do this. It's so hard. You've got to jump through all these hoops and do all these steps. And it's like, no, you don't. Jesus didn't have to do all that. He just spoke and it happened. That's how it's supposed to work. Okay? So don't fall for the tricks of the enemy. Also, there was a man, and this is, there's a YouTube video of this guy. He had uh, needed both hips replaced. He was a young guy. He was 20 years old. Both hips needed to be replaced. He'd torn two labrums, and he came to my office. His, actually, he was scheduled for surgery one week from the day he saw me, but his mother said, I want you to go to Pastor Tom before you go to surgery, just to see what happens. So she brings this guy, and he, both hips need replacement. He has pain, excruciating pain in both hips. So I pray for him. He gets healed, okay? So he has no pain. He's moving, and like, wow, I feel great. And I said, okay, so let me tell you something. And this is good to know for people that go to church, because you're going to run across this stuff. I said, let me tell you something. The devil's a liar. He's always been a liar. He's not going to change. If you start to feel a little bit of that pain revisiting you tomorrow, like it's going to try to come back, uh, you immediately say, no, get out now. Use your authority. Don't let that pain come back. If you don't fall for this, maybe it's reasonable to feel a little bit still. Don't fall for that. Don't sign for that package when it comes to your door. Say, no, I return to sender. 
So I said, if, this, if tomorrow you feel a little of that pain come back, you say, no, get out now in Jesus' name. So I didn't see the guy for a month. So a month later, he shows up and he says, hey, I want to tell you my story. I said, okay, what happened? He says, well, it was just like you said. The next day, the pain started to creep back a little. I said, no, get out now in Jesus' name. He said, I did that for three days. After the third day, it never came back. I canceled the surgery. I'm completely healed. Okay? So understand, your enemy's going to try to take your faith away by pulling tricks on you. Don't fall for them. You have authority. When you speak, things happen. All right. Now, I'm opening this up to any questions you might have. I can't hear you, sir. Yes, pull of Bethesda, yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, okay, so here's the thing. Uh, there was uh, another time, too, where Jesus said, go and sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. Okay? So here's the thing. Is, this is just a fact. Is Whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, okay, uh, when you yield to sin, when you give in to sin, you give place to the devil. Even Christians can give place to the devil. That's what the Bible says to Christians, give no place to the devil. And you know what? When the devil comes and oppresses, he doesn't possess Christians, but he can oppress. When he comes and oppresses, he brings his junk with him, including sickness and everything else. You dabble with sin a whole lot, you're inviting a lot of presence of the enemy and giving him space in your life. Don't give him space in your life. Turn completely to God, okay? Have I seen Christians get themselves bound up in stuff because they were given to some particular sin? Yes, I have. Yes. And they have been just completely defeated in their life, and they don't even have enough faith now to, to resist a lot of these things because they've given into it so much. Now, they don't have to be this way. They can be delivered, but they have yielded. And you yield to sin, and it brings all kinds of bad, react, bad stuff because the devil brings his stuff with him, just like the Holy Spirit brings his healing with him. He brings his, uh, you know, he brings the word of knowledge. He brings revelation. He brings the, the teaching of the Scripture. He brings all that. Well, the devil brings his junk too, okay? So, if you think you're, you're not saved and you get healed and you're going to go out there and just live a sinner's life again, you think stuff won't happen to you, stuff will happen to you because you're vulnerable if you aren't saved. That's why I try to lead people, everybody that gets uh, healed, I try to lead them to Jesus. And if they don't come to Jesus right then, I pray at least that God will preserve them long enough for them to consider and perhaps at some point say, okay, I'm ready, okay? But it doesn't negate the fact that when you were there in their presence, even if they're a sinner, when you were there in their presence, they felt the power of God and God did something in their life. They still have that memory that God has the power to do something if I go to Him. So, we'll leave that like that. Anybody else? Yes. Well, we'll start with you then. You. Right. So, that's, I, I, I was saying that. You, you say this. You say, they say, I have no pain. You say, is there anything else I could pray for you for? Could it be your family, finances, whatever, whatever. Okay? Yeah. You find if there's an open door somewhere for them to pray. Now, I'm going to tell you what. What if they say, I've had this happen. This is, this is fun. You'll like this. What if they say like this, I'm an atheist. You know what my reaction is? Awesome. I love to pray for atheists. That's my reaction to atheists. And they go, what? What? Yeah. And, in fact, I remember this. I was taking this one young lady out. First time she'd ever been out. She'd never seen a miracle. I said, you're going to see miracles at your own hand today. She's like, really? So we find this woman, young woman, sitting at a bus stop, and she was a lesbian for sure. You could tell she was like, macho guy. And she's sitting there, and I said, excuse me, my name's Tom. This is my friend, so-and-so. We pray for people. Do you have any pain in your body? She's like, I'm an atheist. I go, that's okay. I like praying for atheists. She's like, what? I go, just tell me, it, you know, you can prove me wrong. Prove, prove that my God doesn't exist if you think you're an atheist. So I said, prove it. Do you have any pain in your body? She goes, yeah, I got my nose broken last night in a bar fight. I go, awesome. <laughs> I said, this young lady here who's never prayed for anybody, she's going to pray for you and God's going to heal you. She's like, right, that's not going to happen. I go, hey, prove me wrong. She's like, go for it. So I said to this young lady, 
I said, I said, so put your finger. I, I said, check your nose out first. Is how bad does it hurt? She's like, oh, she's just touching it. She's like, oh my gosh, it's like eight. Oh, ow, ow. I go, okay, good. So I said to this young lady, I said, just touch your nose really lightly, and say this, say in Jesus' name, you know, nose be healed, whatever I said like that. And I said, keep your hand there for a minute because I want to ask her a question. So I'm asking the atheist. I said, because sometimes it doesn't matter if you do or don't feel anything, but sometimes they feel something like tingling or something. So I said, why the hand was there? I said, what are you feeling going on in your nose? She goes, absolutely nothing. I go, that's not a problem. Keep your hand there. You can take your hand off. I go, now go ahead, test it out. She's like, right. She goes, oh, my God. She was completely healed. And I go, that's amazing. The God you don't believe in just healed you. She's like, I go, you're probably not an atheist now, are you? She's like, okay. So when they shut the door, it has to be a really clear, no thank you. And then you know what you do? You don't go, oh, what a bummer. I'm, I'm depressed. I don't want to pray for anybody. No, you just go, move on. There's somebody out there waiting for me. That fish got off the line. I'll go to the next fish. There's more fish out there. Now, one more thing about fishing I want to say is, uh, see, the way Christians have made it is they think, uh, we want to be fishers of men. So here's how we're going to fish. We're going to create a fish trap. It's called a church. We're going to set up a nice trap. We'll dangle stuff, lures out front, free coffee, you know, classes for all your psychological needs, you know, um, class for, you know, unwed mothers who are actually men, you know, I mean, all these classes and all these programs and all this stuff, you're dangling this to hopefully lure fish into your fish trap. And the fish come into the door and you go, ha, we got you, you're in church, we got you. That is not how you fish. Here's how you fish. You go out to where fish are. They're not in here. These fish are already caught. You need to get fish out there to come into here. You need to go out and catch them. So you need to go out where the fish are. That means where people are that don't know Jesus. And you need to fish where they are. And when you go out fishing, you know, you don't know what's going to happen when you fish, do you? You can't tell somebody, I'm going to go fishing and catch three fish today, and they'll be five pounds. What you're going to pull up till you pull it up. But you're going to go fishing because I've learned this. If you don't go fishing, you won't catch any fish. And you say, but I went out one day and didn't catch any fish. You need to fish some more because if you fish regularly, you will end up with a lot of fish stories. I guarantee it. Because eventually, there will be days you catch a limit. It's weird. Some days you can't. Right? Okay. Next question. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. That's a great question. Praying for yourself. Have I got the wrong microphone? <laughs> We're good? So praying for yourself, that's a good question. Praying for yourself is just like praying for uh, relatives sometime, okay? Which is this. I'm going to tell you what. I know people that pray for themselves very successfully. They say, need be healed and they're healed. For it, this. I have poor success. So you know what I do? I have other people pray for me. Because it's hard to be uh, objective when it's your own body. It's hard. You're feeling the pain, and now you're trying to do. See, it's easy for me to pray for a stranger. It's a lot easier. It's hard for me. So my head gets in the way sometimes when it's myself. So that's what the Bible says. Pray for one another that you might be healed. You know, God put us together so we're not just all by ourselves. Other. So you're not possible. good at it. Okay. Way back there. Yes? Refuse prayer? Of course, all the time. But I'm going to tell you, it's a lot less than you would imagine, okay? Um, if you're polite, you'll find most people will be polite back. And I want to tell you, like, I live in a place, uh, Seattle is the second least churched 
community in the United States. Okay? So you talk about a tough crowd, you know, it doesn't affect me at all. I just ignore that because I'm just fishing. If I don't catch that fish, I'll catch that fish. It's okay. I'm fishing. I don't let it discourage me. Um, but the thought is in Seattle, there's so many atheists in Seattle, the thought is, is that people are going to be atheist on you and get all mad like, you Christians, I hate all you people. And I want to tell you, I've prayed for I've approached thousands of people. And you know what? Most of the time, because I'm polite, even the atheists are polite back. The thought that they're going to all be hating on you is extremely rare. And almost every time that's happening where somebody cussed me out, it's because they were crazy. I mean, really crazy or drugged up. Normal people mostly won't do that. They'll be polite if you're polite. So that's just somebody, we build up this giant in our head that we're going to confront, and it usually never happens. Ignore that, okay? What else? Other hand. Yes. Um, I was just wondering if you ever uh, pray for somebody that had that. Okay, so, so I'll pray for it. Now, honestly, as we know, you know, there's some things that uh, our faith is growing as we keep doing this, and there's some things I haven't beaten yet but I'm going to keep praying for it. I, there's a young, young girl. She's like 15 years old in our church. She has cerebral palsy. I prayed for that tons of times. Hasn't been healed yet, but you know what? I will not give up. I'm going to keep praying for that girl. Now, someday, if I see that breakthrough for with cerebral palsy, it's going to be easier on the second one. But if I stop, it's never, never going to happen. So, I pray for it. Now, addiction, I'll tell you one funny story about addiction. I'll tell you how you can help people that have certain addictions, like, let's say, let's just take cigarettes. That's, that's a pretty easy one, okay? I'll tell you how to pray for people that have cigarette addiction. Right now, I do, and they do what they like, okay? So, I just pray, pray that when this person tries to smoke cigarettes again, it will be destroyed. Disgusting. It will be nauseating. They will be so sick from this, they won't be able to stand it. And you know what? That will cure them quick because they'll go, oh, my God, I can't. Ugh. Suddenly they're over it. So I've had that happen so many times. My sister-in-law was one of those and another person. It's like they, they said, the next time I took a cigarette, it was disgusting. I couldn't even stand it. And they loved it before. Right. And so there's this one guy in our church. He's quitting now. But... This so one guy, pray that he, it's just so gross, he can't stand. Suddenly, so and I, I, I just go, and I think it's going to work, right? And then I see him like a month later, and I start talking. I say, so, did you quit smoking now? He goes, no. I go, really? So it didn't work? He goes, oh, it worked. They taste terrible, but I just keep smoking. <laughs> that particular guy, it wasn't enough. He finally quit, though. He says, yeah, they taste horrible now, but I still smoke. Okay, didn't expect that. All right, so yes, you can pray against addiction. Anything you can pray, anything. You see, when you say, uh, you know, can we pray for this? Hey, God can do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you could ask or think. What I think? Well, if it's a new thing I haven't encountered or something I've never seen a breakthrough, I'm going for it just to watch, give God an opportunity to do something I've never seen. Because like I said, Sometimes, like the woman that came up to me with breast cancer the first time, I wasn't ready. My faith wasn't there, but I just went for it. You know what? She got healed. So it's like, oh, I just got stretched. Good. Go for it. Don't just be bold. Just be bold. Yeah, anybody else? Yeah. Okay, so, all right. So I would do this is I believe very, very often, obviously, there is physical, uh, chemical addiction in your body, but often there's a spirit involved with drug addiction. So, I, I address it like that. I say, I say, I speak to this spirit of addiction in this person, and I bind it right now in Jesus' name, and I command it to let them go now. And I say, all chemical addiction, you know, go now. And I just address it. There's both sides of it, the spirit and the, and the natural side of it. That's the way I do it. Bipolar. Okay, so this is a good one. 
is uh, honestly, um, I've had a couple of successes with people that had psychological problems, okay? Um, because, like, there's this one little boy that had all kinds of psychological problems. I pray for him. He's totally healed. But I have had others, you know, maybe an adult had bipolar, and I have had little success at it. Now, does that mean God can't do it? No, because it's been done. Have I had great success at it? No, I'm still working on that, okay? Seems trickier. I don't know why. Shouldn't be. But uh, regardless, whatever, if it's bipolar, I'm going to just call it what it is. See, I like to do this too. When I'm praying over somebody, if it has a name, if somebody tagged it with a name, a name like it's, it's, its name. And so I won't just say, you know, I pray that their mind, you know, gets straightened out. I'm going to say, bipolar, I'm speaking to you. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Now, if I'm praying for somebody, like, this happens sometimes too. They've got a back pain, and I'm praying, and, and I say, so what's your pain? And they say, well, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's not pain anymore, but it's stiff. I call it whatever they call it. If they call it stiff, I call it stiff. Stiffness go. If they call it pain, I call it all pain go. They say, it's burning, all burning go. Whatever they call it, they got a name on it. I'm going to call it that and tell it to go because it's like I'm addressing different dogs, you know. This dog, that dog, sit, stay, go. Understanding I have authority t- to speak. Yeah. Right. Oh, yes. So suppose, <coughs> excuse me, suppose you pray for somebody, and like I said, I don't see 100%, but I see 70 to 80%, which is very encouraging, and you'll start to really re- revel in that. I mean, it's wonderful to see that many people healed. Um, but what about the two or three you, you don't see something happened? What do you do with that? Okay. So here's what I do. Let's say I prayed for them, and they say, pain's not gone. It's still there. So I try another tack. Well, I pray this way. It's still there. Pray this way. It's still there. And <coughs> it's obvious they're done, and I don't know what else to do. So what I do is this. I don't want to close the window on their faith. I want to leave it open. So I say, okay. Well, I want to thank you for letting me pray for you, you know. I, I wanted to see it right now, but, but you know what? Let's watch it for the next 24 hours. Watch it. And, and here's my card, and you let me know what happens because I know God can do it. And I've had people who got healed later, okay? That can happen. So if you say this to yourself, I guess it didn't work. You've just shut the door. It's done. It's done. Don't give up. Say it could happen. Now, um, this one woman I prayed for, she had a giant lump on the back of her neck, and three days later, it was gone, completely gone, okay? And it had been there for years, all right? Um, I remember this story. I have a picture on my phone, too, uh, that Curry Blake tells, and this is one of the best stories I ever heard. Uh, Curry Blake had this picture he was showing us, and it showed all these sparkly, shiny things on a piece of fabric. And he goes, you know what that is? No idea what that is. So he says, well, a woman came to one of his meetings, and she had back pain, and she told Curry that she had um, uh, all this surgery done to her back, and they put screws and rods in her back and all this stuff, and she still had pain. It didn't fix her. So Curry prayed for her, said, how is it? Check it out. She said, no difference. He said, well, go home, go to bed, wake up, see how it is. So she woke up, and I have the picture on my phone, and there's a picture. She woke up. All the metal pieces that were in her back were laying next to her in bed. She's completely healed. So you know what? Don't give up if it's not right then. I expect it right then. I'm not going to let that uh, make me start to expect things tomorrow. I'm expecting them right now. But if it doesn't happen, if I've done my best and it doesn't happen, I'm going to say let's just keep our faith, that window open, and see what happens tomorrow, right? I had also, I've had this, I've had lots of accidental healings too. (laughs) Like like I had this lady, she had bad back in... uh, and I prayed for her leg grew out. Oh, and by the way, before we go out, I'll tell you what, before we go out today, if there's anybody here who's never seen a miracle, right, I'll sh- I always do this. We'll show you one before we go out because we'll grow somebody's leg out. And you might go, well, how do we know somebody's leg's short? Somebody's leg's short. But besides that, if it isn't short, I'll grow it out anyway because I want you to see it with your own eyes so you go, I've seen a miracle now. I think I'm ready. Okay, so we'll do that. But I prayed for this one lady. She had a bad back. And she calls me and says, Tom, I can smell. I go, what do you mean you can smell? 
She goes, I haven't smelled a thing in 15 years. But I said, I prayed for your back. She goes, I know, my nose got healed. Okay, I'll take that. Why not? Yeah. So that kind of weird stuff happens. Yes. <clears throat> if I walk up to somebody and they have lots of different things going on, do you just call them all out one by one? Well, yeah, here's, here's what I do. Um, suppose they have 10 different things. You know, sometimes people come to our healing service and they bring two sheets of paper, all these lists, 23 things wrong with them. Man, that's a lot of stuff to work through. So here's what I do. I want to start at the top. I go, what's the worst pain, the worst thing? I want to go for that one. Because a lot of times I just knock that one off and the rest go. Go for the big one. Don't go for the, don't say I'm going to work my way up to the bigger one. Start at the top. Say, what's the worst? They say, I've got 10 different pains in my body. What's the worst one? That's what I want to pray for. And you pray for that one. Once that one falls, they'll all fall. And maybe you'll have to pray for the others, but they'll all fall because the first one falls. That's it. That's the big stronghold. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, way back there. Excuse me? What's that? Yes, approaching. <laughs> no. <laughs> he says, if you look too nice, is it creepy? I suppose if you've got a really weird grin on your face, they might think you're a psycho. But just look normal. Try to look normal. Try to look normal. You know, people that are always smiling, you know, you think, well, there's something wrong with that guy. But just look normal. Look relaxed. Look normal. Look pleasant. Yes. Right. You go with that. Because here's the thing. You could get words of knowledge, too. Uh, you know, the Lord could speak to you. Like, I've been praying for people, and I say, you, you know, I'm feeling like you have an issue with your father, don't you? And they go, yeah. That's really the bigger reason I'm here, is because this is a big wound in your life. And you deal with it as the Lord reveals it to you, because he will reveal things to you. I know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'll stay here. There's a guy. Larry's got it. didn't know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Well, you could do that if you feel that, but that's why I do give them, I give them my card and I say, I want to know, you know, find out, let me know. But I have had people, I've had people right then and there call the person and, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah. 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 Uh-huh. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, that you need yeah, you see you need something that's that the people can be followed up with somehow because if they go, "Wow, I met this person, maybe it was an angel, you know." And I got healed, and I have no idea who they are or what they're all about. It's like, no, here's, here's somebody you can talk to. Here's somebody that can help you further down the road in your spiritual walk. Now, you had a question, I guess. Go ahead. Yeah, I was wondering if you've ever uh, had or prayed for, the, like, autism or mental retardation. Yeah, yeah, I have. I have. That's, that's the same with any other kind of psychological problem, okay, is I've prayed for it. I have seen uh, some of the symptoms of it. You know, maybe they had violent reactioners. Some of that settled down. I have not seen an autistic person completely healed when I've prayed for them yet. But I will not turn down praying for them. And I have seen a video of a kid that was completely autistic 
being completely healed. So I know it's possible, right? So I haven't encountered every kind of disease. But when I find a new one, I'm going to encounter it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it just like everything else, yeah. You know, when you're talking about the net, I think that's a great point that you're, and you always want to give somebody follow-up because how would you like for them, you led them to the Lord and they don't know where to go to church and they go to some Calvinistic church that's a cessationist church and, and you know, they're going to lead them off in a complete different direction. At least be in relationship with the church that you know will, when they come in, their faith is going to be built up and they're going to help them mature in the Lord. So you don't want to just, it's like giving birth to a baby and giving it up for, you know, to somebody that you have no idea is going to take care of that baby, right? You want to make sure that baby is taken care of. So know a good church that you can refer them to so they can grow in the Lord. Yes, Carol? I'd like for you to reshow your approach and also I want to make a real clear thing because most people pray long prayers and it just shows that they're not they don't have their faith for, to do it and uh, directing it to whatever is the problem and because that seems to be a, a major problem for most people praying long prayers okay so I want to tell you the truth for example um, if you see me, like, say, grow a leg out, okay? Now, it's not a trick. There's people on the Internet who say, you can do this as a trick, and they pull the shoe part way off, okay? But I prove beyond a doubt to people. I go, you push the shoes on, you hold the, you do everything, and they can see it's not a trick, it's real. So there's the real, and then there's the fake, okay? Um, so I'm going to tell you something is that you have to have a mindset, which is this, is Jesus is in you, he is, whether you feel like him, feel him or not, and he's with you, and he's for you, and he actually wants to participate. He wants to be a, a co-laborer with you in doing this, and he actually wants to make this work for you, even if you're, uh, you know, the child trying to learn to walk. He isn't like, you know, well, they're, they're staggering around. They fell down. What a klutz. He's like, no, you can do it. Get up. Do it again. He wants you to succeed in this. So when I grow a leg out now, I don't even say anything. I don't have to say anything. But I could. I could say something. I could point to it. I could just look at it. I could do whatever I want. He will just back me up because I've, I have that understanding. He's going to back me up. So I've, I've healed people with all kinds of different methods, and it was a, a thing I was testing is, you know, what if you just point at somebody from across a room? Can they be healed? Yes. Just done it many times. What about shadows? Many times. A lot of my videos, you see shadow healings. Put a shadow over somebody, they get healed. What about just handing them a card and saying, hold this, and saying nothing? Yes. Anything you can think of, if you have the mindset that Father is going to back me up, he'll back you up. You'd be amazed. You can, I've, said, I've said to people one time, I ran out of ideas on what can I try, and this one guy says, why don't you do a group healing where you heal everybody at the same time? I go, okay, I'm going to figure that out. So I've got a video. You'll see it. A bunch of kids at a mall. There were three or four of these kids, they were athletes at school, they were teenagers, and they had all had different injuries. And they were sitting at a table, and I go, how am I going to do this? I got to pray for them all at the same time, they all got a different injury, different pains. I said, um, I'll just make it up, because I believe Jesus, he's for me. He wants me to succeed in this. So I said, everybody put their hands on the table. <laughs> and I said, okay, so I'm going to do this. I'm going to put my hand on this end of the table. You're all touching the same table. I, was, I said, everybody be healed now in Jesus' name. And they were all healed. Whatever I could think of, he'd do it because he says, I want you to succeed in this. I'm not trying to make this like a combination lock, and if you get one wrong, it doesn't work. He says, I, whatever you say, I'm going to back you up. If you say a simple prayer, remember the little boy that said, bad eyes, I don't like you? The guy got healed. That wasn't a very good prayer, but it worked, right? So you don't have to also pray around the world, you know? Oh, Lord, I thank you for the heavens and the earth and the galaxies. And it's like, oh, psst, psst. The people don't have that kind of time. You just speak to the thing like you're talking to a dog. You don't give dogs long instructions. You say, sit, go, stay, right? So you say, pain, go. <laughs> Broken bone, be healed, whatever it is, right? And you make it simple. And the approach, the approach, one more time with the approach. It's really simple. 
I don't look freaked out. I don't look weird. I just look relaxed. And I just walk a person like I'm just asking them directions, you know? Excuse me, can I ask you a question? Okay. No, I start. I say, my name's Tom. It's my friend so-and-so. We pray for people, and God heals them. I just wanted to ask you if you had any pain in your body. Go from there, right? It's really simple, okay? Sounds simple, doesn't it? So what if you mess up? How are you going to learn if you don't just go out and do it? You just got to do it, right? Uh, is it scary? Well, like I said, jumping out of the airplane might be scary. You do it 50 times, it's not scary. It's no big deal. I can walk up to anybody. You can, too, if you do it a few times. If you do it a few times, you'll get over it. You'll get over it, okay? Anybody else? Over here, yes. Well, in the Bible, the, they pray for the man or person who kept falling in the fire. And, and Jesus, the disciples, prayed for him. That's right. This person and said, why couldn't we not right. do this? And he, Jesus said, because this kind comes out not except by fasting and prayer. So fasting plays a part Okay, hold on. That isn't what he said. You know what he said? He said something before he said that. He said, they said, Master, how come we could not do this? He said, because of your unbelief. A little bit later on, he says, how be it this kind, in one of the Gospels, how be it this kind cometh not out but by prayer and fasting. But the first answer was because of your unbelief. Okay? So what's prayer and fasting got to do with it? Well, does prayer and fasting make demons weaker? No. It gets your flesh out of the way because you're operating in doubt and unbelief. It weakens your flesh, which makes your spirit shine forth more. So he was saying, you guys have been too carnal. You need to fast a little bit so you're less carnal, more spiritually minded, because your unbelief was the problem. That's all the problem was, their unbelief. Is you can work on unbelief by just getting a little bit more spirit-minded and a less, little bit less fleshly. Because they had been arguing about who gets to sit, you know, on the right hand and who gets to be the highest in the kingdom. It's like, you guys are in your flesh. Just stop that. Okay? So his answer was, because of your unbelief. Do you remember that? Yeah. That, I don't know if that's the same one, but I know. That's it's the same one. The I guarantee it. Likewise, they coupled prayer with fasting. So does right. fasting Old, play a Old good Testament. part in well, fasting, look, fasting is this. Fasting is just a way to discipline your flesh, okay? You don't gain brownie points with God for fasting. What you do is you learn how to subject your flesh to the things of the Spirit and say, now you need to learn who's boss. Flesh is not boss. It's putting your flesh in its place, okay? Um, <clears throat> now, I'm going to tell you this, is that all the healings that you see on my videos, I didn't fast the day before that. There's nothing wrong with fasting. It's a good discipline. But whether I fasted or didn't fast didn't make any difference, all right? Unbelief is the problem. If you don't believe, it just won't happen. In fact, if you fast for 10 years but still have unbelief, it still won't happen, okay? However, if you have faith, even if you didn't fast, it'll happen. So let's also remember this, is when Jesus was walking around on earth in his earthly ministry before he was resurrected, he was still walking in the Old Testament. They were still under the Old Covenant. Jesus, the, the Spirit of God was not living in men in those days. But we're on this side. Now we got him in us. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world, right? And you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, right? And he says, the things that I did, you can do and greater things because I go to the Father. And what happens if he goes to the Father? He goes, because if I go to the Father, he's going to send the Comforter into you. And you're going to be walking around with the Holy Spirit in you, and you have all the power of God that you're carrying with you. Okay? Yeah. All right? Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. These are good questions, okay? So here's the answer to that. He didn't say he couldn't. He said he didn't. It's real simple. If, uh, if I was a big name like, say, Benny Hinn, now, he's kind of not my cup of tea, but I'm just going to say, if I was a big name like Aunt Penny Hinn, and I came to town and said, I'm going to be at this church, place be packed, all right, thinking that this guy's well-known, he's got some kind of healing power, right? Um, so, I'm going to show up. I'm going to show up, place be packed, right? Um, because people actually have faith that this man carries some kind of anointing to do this kind of a thing, 
and so they're showing up. But if I said, I'm Ralph the farmer, and I'm praying for people, people go, who's he? Nobody, I don't believe he's got power. He's a farmer. What's he got? So they don't show up. So let's say three people show up for Ralph the farmer, and he prays for them, they all get healed. Guess what? He couldn't heal a whole lot of people in town because only three showed up. See, when Jesus went to his own town, a whole lot didn't show up because they didn't believe in him. They didn't have faith in him. And so he only healed a few because there were only a few that came. He went to these other towns, massive crowds came. He healed a whole lot of people. Because here's what it says, he healed all that were brought to him, everyone. And I want you to know this, you have mindsets, we could go into this for days. You got mindsets that are not in the Bible, just throw them out. But they make sense. Yes, that's your natural mind trying to make sense of spiritual stuff. Throw it out. Here's a mindset. Um, God will only heal you at a certain time. It's not His timing. Well, no. By His stripes you are healed. His timing is right now. He paid the price. He wants you to have it now. So why doesn't it happen? I don't always know, but I know what He wants. His desire is for you to be healed now, for you to prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers, okay? So you say, well, I think God only heals certain individuals. Uh, Well, Jesus healed all that were brought to Him. Do you think all the people that were brought to Jesus, when it says He healed all of them, He healed all the sick and all that were oppressed of the devil, do you suppose all the people that were brought to Him, uh, they were all walking with God, they were all perfect, they were all holy, they were all fasting, they were all doing everything they should do. He didn't say, you know what, I'll heal everybody. Not you, you're not right with God yet, so I'm not going to heal you. He healed everybody that was brought. He gave it to everybody. So we got all kinds of conditions, we think, before God will heal. And he never had those conditions on anybody. He healed everybody that was brought to him. Here's what needs to be done for healing to occur. Somebody on earth needs to have faith. Now, when people come to my healing services, first of the month we have a healing service, I let them know. I say, you know what? Somebody's been lying to you about this stuff about that you have to have faith and I have to have faith, and we put our faith together, and if you don't get healed, it's your fault you didn't have faith. That's a lie. That's why I can pray for atheists and they get healed, because I'll have faith. At least I know I'll have faith. You'll have faith. The woman who had the issue of blood, you know, she got healed not because Jesus had faith, even though Jesus had faith. She got healed because of her own faith. That's what it says. God did not tell her You need to go and touch Jesus' garment. She told herself, it says, she said to herself, if I touch the hem of his garment, I will be healed. She went, she did it, and goes, oh, somebody touched me. I felt the power go from me. He said, your faith's made you whole. That was her faith. Then you got the centurion soldier. He's got his servant back home, not even there. And the centurion soldier said, I believe you don't even need to come to my house. You just speak the word, he'll be healed. The centurion soldier faith, uh, the centurion soldier's faith, got his servant healed back in another town who maybe have had no faith. But somebody had faith. It could be the person praying. It could be the person receiving. It could be you for somebody else. Just as long as somebody's got faith, God can do it. Okay? Okay. One more. Larry. Right. Sure. Oh, yeah. Okay, I'll tell you what I used to do, and other people do it now with my videos, which is surprising to me, is I psych myself up because your natural mind, it's got all kinds of fear and issues. So I used to watch my old friend, Pete Cabrera. I used to watch some of his really old videos before I go out. I watched 10 videos, and I'm psyched. I'm ready to go. I don't watch them anymore because I don't need to anymore. But I have people tell me, I watched, you know, 10 Tom Loud videos, and I can go out. You know what? You'll get over that pretty soon. You don't need to do that anymore. But have I done that to encourage myself? Yes, I've done that. And that, that helped me get all hyped up, like, this is exciting. Let's go do it. Yeah, whatever it takes to get your mind out of the way and, you know, to get you encouraged. That's a good thing. Okay, so now, um, who has never seen a miracle with their own eyes? You mean all these people here have seen a miracle except this one man back here? All you have seen a miracle with your own eyes. I'm not talking about, I'm saying a visible miracle. I'm not talking about somebody got healed of cancer, you couldn't see the cancer. I'm talking about you visible miracle. You've never seen one. 